what if, what if we've somehow forgotten who we are? I know it seems ridiculous, but it's not as crazy a question as you might think at first. Who we are, our identity, it can be something that we have a firm grip on. It can be something that um, we don't have a firm grip on, right? We, have, we lose sight of our identity. We can experience confusion over our identity. That's never happened to me, by the way. Um, <clears throat> we can wish we were someone, but we're not. And then we can project that out to other people. And we are even capable of holding to a false sense of who we are and then acting accordingly. And out of all these, that's perhaps the worst version of them all. But without getting too distracted, because you know me, I can get distracted, without getting too distracted in the tall weeds of how we determine our identity, man, I could tell you a lot about that. <clears throat> Let's establish something right off the bat. Let's establish that we do have an absolute true identity and that it can be known and that as believers, it is vital to understand our true identity. As Christians, it's all too easy, though, to forget our real identity and default to what? To a false sense of who we are in order to just keep things going from day to day. Because we have so much to do. It's busy. We have obligations. We have a lot to accomplish. There are a lot of things to take care of. And we don't really have time to pay attention to that. Who has the time anyway? In the busyness of life, how often do we take time and fully understand and the meaning of who we are. Yet, turns out, it's incredibly important for us to have a solid sense of who we are. Now, I had an opportunity last year to take some time and do just that. Last year, I had the opportunity to go sailing with my buddy, Craig. He's my sailing buddy. And we don't get to go out sailing enough but we do occasionally get to go out. And sailing is part of a time in my life that I kind of miss. I used to sail with my dad, and I, I miss that time. It was a long time ago. It was before I was married. Um, <clears throat> and by going sailing, I, I really, it, it, just, it just sparked me, right? It just reminded me, wow, this is great. I just love being here, unplugging from all the busyness and from from my business and from all the obligations and just being out in the water and the peace and the solitude. And so I begin to reflect about that. And it gave me an opportunity to gain a better sense of what I'm going to call my aging identity. Okay? You cannot repeat that. Okay? But it did. I started to contemplate that, right? And it reestablished some central points of who I am. Now, we'll get back to that in a minute. But really, I want, I want us to look at, there are so many ways that we can use to define who we are. And an easy one, let's just take, I don't know, appearance and mannerisms, right? Like that guy with all the white hair, or that guy that goes around hugging people. Or that guy that kind of a little bit sort of looks like George Clooney. <laughs> well, but that doesn't get us very far, really, if we start there. And so we have to graduate to things. Things. Things we own or things we want to own. Of course, the things that we choose to have are kind of an expression of ourselves, right? Our likes, our interests, our passions. After all... For there your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Things can be used to fill up emptiness inside us. Maybe we're looking for something and we're not finding it. And we're filling it up with things because we don't have a good sense of who we are. Sometimes our things can define us, right? Because we're, I don't know, maybe preoccupied with them. Let's illustrate that with a couple of random pictures here. Here's one of a beautiful sunset. 
There's a nice sunset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And here's another one of there's some people, they're doing something in their front yard. I pulled these right just randomly off the internet. They have nothing to do with me. And I resent if you're thinking they might, but. But this kind of stuff, looking at the things, right, it's going to lead us to the next thing, which is even more important. And that's what we might do. When we think about our identity, we, we can't help but think about doing. Because doing is so, it's so prominent, it's so present. It's so observable. When we observe something, doing is something you can observe. We can't help but use what we do to define ourselves. It's inevitable. Let's just take the obvious example of what we do for a living. We're constantly defining ourselves based on our jobs, right? Is that who we are? Or is that what we do? Or maybe it's kind of both, right? And it's natural. I get it. It is natural. What you do says something about you. What you do for a job, but what you do with your own time. It says something about you. And these descriptors are about what we do or titles that describe how we spend a lot of our time and our energy. And they do speak about who we are. Now, I'll go back to my sailing trip and I'll share more of this personal example of I don't know, I just, I was so unplugged, I couldn't help but be reflective. And so, <clears throat> it is a time I miss, I don't get to do it enough, and every time that I go out on the sailboat, I'm out in the water, I'm pretty happy. I like it. It's good for me. And I reflected on that and I realized, yeah, I, I, get, I am a sailor, I, I guess that's true. I, I'm a sailor, right? I don't frequently think of myself that way, but kind of true, even though I don't go off it. And that led me to think about other things too. Think about other roles I have in my life, other things that I do. And in predictable day fashion, just adding myself there, my thinking and my pondering and my reflecting, it all generated me to write some of these things down. Right? And I'm going to show you that in a bit. Um, and I sent it to one of my family members. Okay, I sent it to a lot of my family members because you never know. Your phone might, you know, go overboard. Okay, here it is. It, here's what I sent to um, is my daughter. And um, you can see there, it's made up of a lot of things that I do. They're titles, you might call them. They reflect my doing and how I spend my time. But you know, as I went on in this process, the list began to expand when I, when I realized that, yeah, I, I'm more than just my uh, jobs, my activities, you know, what I do, my interests that I have. I have relationships, of course, I have all these relationships. And they have a big impact on who I am and how I behave. And you know what? That is the way it should be. Who you are should drive the way you behave. That's how it should work. The choices you make and how you live your life, the lifestyle you create, which it most certainly does, right? For better, but and for worse. So behaviors, interests, roles, things, they all express our identity. But something else is driving that. And <clears throat> this is what the world right now is missing and why there's such an identity crisis. We are using things, actions, associations that reflect our identity, yeah, as our actual identity, uh, no. And consequently, when, when we do that, we're removing that core piece of who we are as a person, or at least we're covering it up. The whole process of reflecting on who we are, on our identity, I want you to hear that's a good thing. These are thoughts that should come into your head. You should have a good sense of who you are.
Because when we have a firm grip on who we are, then we are able to move through life from that firm grip of our identity. Our doing needs to reflect ourselves, and it does, but it needs to not define ourselves. And doing isn't just doing, though, is it, right? It involves thinking and feeling. Of course it does. And if we can be aware of the experience of doing, especially in the moment, we sometimes call that mindfulness, then we can start to get away from that artificial sense of ourself from just the physical doing and begin to experience the being that takes place in all that we do. And that, and what really, if you think about that, what comes first? Is the chicken or the egg? Is our identity shaped by our experience of doing? Or is our doing an outgrowth of who we are being? And the answer, of course, is yes. Yes, it is. It's a feedback loop. It just feeds on itself, and you get input from both directions. Being leads to doing, and then doing affirms being. Got it? Right. Okay. Now, doing and being, they can certainly define our experience, but our experiences don't really define who we are. They don't define our identity. And the question can be raised, is there a greater starting point of our identity? And that's going to lead us right into creating a more purposeful, meaningful, thoughtful sense of our own identity apart from this feedback loop that I've been talking about of doing and being. And by moving beyond using that feedback loop, then we're able to see immediately, yep, our identity is grounded in God. Who God is, I do want you to hear that, who God is reflects who we are. Because we are his actions, his doings, his associations. And when we understand who God is, then we can understand who we are. John, 1 John 3, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God? And so we are. We are children of God because God called us children of God. He redeemed us to become and live out our full identity as children of God. Everything that I've laid out so far for you it's been so that you have the groundwork to move beyond that experience, beyond the comfortable, the common, the usual, what you're often experiencing in that feedback loop so that you can move beyond that and that you can examine and gain a more adequate sense of who you are. Because having a true and grounding sense of who you are is essential in living an authentic, meaningful life. And I'm going to do this early. I'm going to tell you what my premise is. And if you walk away today with one thing, I really want you to catch this one thing. We are defined by who God is. We're defined by who God is. Therefore, when we forget, when we forget who God is, we forget who we are. When we lose sight of God, who God is, we lose sight of our own identity. Our identity, our true and authentic identity, is tied to the type of God that He is. It's directly tied to God, our true identity. Now, almost all of you here are going to be familiar with this. We talk a lot about activation here at Kingship. And we do that because it's part of, wait for it, it's part of our identity as a church, isn't it? 
Yeah, that's why we talk about it a lot. And, and when we talk about activation, we are talking about a thrust, a thrust of the church. It's our desire as His church to help people come to understand their purpose and their value in Christ and to equip them to be active in the kingdom of God. So when you listen to that, you realize, well, it's not just our identity as a church, as kingship. No, we're promoting it as the identity of the believer, the identity of you, a redeemed, the child of God. It's your identity. And let's ask another question, since we're big on questions today. Is it possible to truly and meaningfully be activated in the kingdom of God if we don't have a clear sense of who we are? Obviously, the answer is no, it's not possible. We can't do it. And we must come to fully and meaningfully understand who we are as believers in order to be in the will of the Father, in order for our purpose and our value in Christ to be known, and thus to be active in the kingdom of God. And to go to that full meaning of who we are will mean that we have to come to the full understanding of who God is. Well, that is a lifetime endeavor. And it's a good thing everyone here has a lifetime because you're going to need it. Now, when I conceptualize this, looking at our identity, and I conceptualize three layers in looking at our identity from a biblical perspective, okay? First, the first layer is to understand who we are, all of us, as human beings. That shouldn't be too hard. And no, we're not an accident from some random interchange with evolution. Firstly and foremost, we are purposefully created beings made in the image of our Creator, God Himself. And there's a difference between a child of God versus being made in the image of God. So God created man in His own image, in the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. Yet while we are image bearers, we also carry a fallen nature that rebels and it's passed on through the disobedience of Adam. And we're all a fallen people, sinful and in need of a path towards being reconciled to God, being back in fellowship with Him. We are all, we're all in need of a Savior. Romans 5, 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. Romans 3, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all have this need for a Savior. Now, the second layer is a little different. What we need to now understand is who we are as believers in Christ, right? As children of God which He gives us the right to become heirs to His kingdom. Now, we just finished this, uh, what I consider a fascinating series on the sacraments, um, truth that we can touch. And it was, it was really neat to take this deep dive into understanding what the sacraments uh, mean for us. And it helps us to think about being activated right? The sacraments do. Because we see our identity born out in the sacraments. We're identified with the death and the resurrection of Christ, died to self, and risen alive and anew in Christ with the seal of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We are then reminded of the cost of our salvation, of the new covenant made for us by the body and the blood of Jesus Christ as he suffered so that we might be reconciled to God. This, 
this is our identity as believers. We are redeemed. We're seen by God the Father in the righteousness of the Son. And we're able to go before God in boldness. Why? Because of our high priest, which is Jesus Christ. This is who we are. Beloved children of God. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit, and we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Now, when we lay it all out like this, right? And that's a lot. You can see it. You can feel it. It has real depth. It's hard to imagine that we can forget our identity in Christ, that we can lose sight of that. Yet the scriptures are replete with examples of God's people doing just that, losing sight of their identity in God and losing sight in their identity in Christ. Let's look at Moses. He's on Mount Sinai. He's receiving the law. What are the Israelites doing during that time? Why? They're making idols. Yeah. Exodus 32. And he received, he being Aaron, the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Really? Huh. Moses was taking what seemed like a long time on the mountain. And there was this mounting tension that was building. And the people became fearful. And they began to implore Aaron to let them turn to something else in the hope of feeling safe again. In other words, safety became more important to them than their identity. And then, once they felt safe, well, then they were right back to figuring out their identity. Then they started forming it with what they had now in front of their attention. But I want you to think about this, because this is hard to believe. They had been brought out of bondage of Egypt. They'd experienced deliverance when they crossed the Red Sea as God parted it. Then they witnessed their enemies being destroyed. But somehow, somehow they lost faith. They abandoned God the God of their deliverance, for what? A golden idol that they themselves made. So, yeah, it does seem that it's easy to forget. Fear of the uncertain or the uncomfortable is powerful, and it has us leaning in, leaning in on our own resources. It's like a pain that we can remedy and maybe short time, right? In the short term, with our own power, like, hmm, think ibuprofen, right? Take ibuprofen, it addresses the symptom, but not the cause, it's very short term. It is very easy to forget who God is when our desire is to address the short term. And in doing so, we lose sight of our identity of God as God's chosen people. We lose sight of that. We give in to temptation, and we create an idol by relying on our own power. Now, I feel that maybe I relate a little more to the disciples than I do the Israelites, but that just could be me, and uh, even so, it still doesn't go well. All right, in Matthew 26, we're reading where Jesus is praying in Gethsemane. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Well, that sounds pretty concerning. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face 
And he prayed. He prayed saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And Jesus came back. He came to the disciples and found them uh, sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me for an hour? An hour. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And there it is. His trusted disciples are sleeping. They're sleeping while Jesus is wrestling in prayer to the Father with the cup that lies before him, the cup that we can't even drink. The beating and the crucifixion and the trial, it's all there before him, which leads up to the real pain and the real suffering and the real agony of Jesus to experience the full wrath of God and to be separated from him. All while being obedient to the Father. The disciples had lost sight of who Jesus was in that moment of the cup that he was about to drink, of the never-ending path forward to follow the will of the Father, even to death. And so in that moment, losing sight of who Jesus was had led them to losing sight of their own identity. As disciples, disciples of the living God and long-awaited Messiah, as disciples who had witnessed the miracles of Jesus firsthand, who walked with Jesus for three years, as disciples to the only one that has the words of eternal life, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. They gave in to the temptation and they fell asleep. The Spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. So, how easy is it to lose sight of who God is? It's easier than we'd like to admit. It's easier than we'd like to believe. Because we are weak. We are weak in our own power. And because we're weak, the mind needs to be constantly renewed. Look at this in Romans 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And when our mind is not renewed, and we are not living in the power of the Holy Spirit, we are falling back. We're falling back into old patterns and common themes. We're relying on that feedback loop of doing and being to define us and to drive us. Now, renewing our mind involves paying attention to what we are nurturing. When we nurture going about our lives in our own strength and our own power because, hey, we're busy. Remember? We're very busy. And when we do that, and it's in our own power, it's as if we're wearing our Christianity like a coat or a mask. We take it off, and we put it on, and we take it off, and we put it on. But if we understand who we are in Christ, it impacts us to the core. We are not wearing our identity. It is who we are. It permeates us. 
We are a redeemed people. But being redeemed is not a stagnant thing. He is maturing us into a greater likeness of Christ. So being redeemed doesn't have a stay about being us. That's not what redeemed is about. But becoming a people who proclaim that Jesus Christ is both Savior and Lord. Because a more matured image of Christ will reflect his desire to proclaim and to save. And this is the identity. This is the identity that can, we can live with day after day after day. It will drive us. It comes from God and who God is and who God says we are. It defines us. You all know this. It's really easy to turn inward. We have needs, real needs. And how we go about meeting those needs will determine if we are living in Christ or living in our own power. If we just address symptoms without paying attention to the underlying cause, we end up masking our unmet needs, and it leaves us tired and unfulfilled and discontent. And it drives us into an unauthentic living, living in our own power, living under the burden of unmet and unresolved needs, which leads us to living outside of his purpose for our life. Inauthentic living is tiring. It's depressing. It's unproductive. It's very discouraging. And it is not living in the power of the Spirit. I want you to consider Jesus meeting the woman at the well. Did you know Jesus was tired? Did you ever notice that? In John 4, 6, we see that Jesus was weary. And yet, he sat at the well and he proclaimed to this woman in need of the living water that he alone could provide. And in the end, in the end, Jesus is not tired after this encounter. No, he's not. He was energized. John 4, 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That food nourished and nurtured Jesus. It energized Jesus. What food? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. This is the activation in the kingdom of God, by doing the will of the Father to accomplish the work that God puts in front of us. It nurtures us, it renews us, it matures us. It addresses the cause, not the symptom, and so it's going to energize us. What was Jesus sent to do that he also sends us to do? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say, there are yet four months? Then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are ripe for harvest. We are energized by the gospel. Jesus is the embodiment of the gospel. So don't you think when he is active and engaged in the work of delivering the gospel that he is going to feel the most like himself, not tired? It's going to resonate. And don't you think that when we are going to do this, that it's going to be the same for us? Jesus prayed to the Father, as you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. 
doing the will of the Father, accomplishing His work, it involves tending to the harvest. Being involved in the city on the hill, right? These, these candles that we sang about this morning, right? Proclaiming the gospel, the good news, that Jesus was, has made a way for us to be reconciled to God, to be seen on that city on the hill, people seeing God in us and being drawn to God because of it. It will resonate when we are actively in the work of sharing the gospel, making disciples. It will mature us in Christ. When we do this, not by our own power, we can't do it by our own power, but by relying on the power of God. There is a harvest and we are called into it. All right, finally, we're arriving at the last layer in understanding our identity. And that is to understand our identity within the local expression of the body of Christ. For all of us right here, that's our identity in Kingship Church, right? If you consider Kingship Church your home church, you need to come to understand where you are. Kingship, guys, kingship is a very young church. We're very young. We are a church planting. And much like planting a seedling in the ground, kingship needs a lot of watering, a lot of attention, a lot of time. If it's to mature and become that stable and strong church. If you are here, congratulations! You are part of the process of planting and nurturing kingship to become that strong and stable church. And guess what? That makes you, yep, a church planter. Yeah, I know it's a title for sure, but it's one that keeps just helps us describe what our work is involving to go about doing the will of the Father and accomplishing His work, His work within this local expression of the body. Now, maybe it's frightening to think of yourself as a church planter, but remember that you and I, we are called to the harvest be it here at Kingship, or be it at any other local expression of the body of Christ. His body is called to the harvest. And the harvest isn't right here. The harvest is all around us. The harvest is outside these walls. And we have to be there outside these walls. It's time. Hmm. Bring me the child. Is he sleeping? Kinda. Hey, buddy. Hello. Hi. Oh, boy. Are you going to help me with this illustration? Hmm? Want to, I want to introduce you to Rick, Karen, Brian, to Noel, Madison, Josiah, to Noah, to Jackson, to Hezekiah. That's a lot of babies. That's a lot of babies. Babies that have been in these arms right here. Man, it's crazy. Babies that have been nurtured. Babies that have been cherished. Babies that have been cared for. Attachments that have been made. I've been responsible 
for caring for nine babies. That's a lot. Three children, six grandchildren. How does that even happen? And look at Hezekiah. He is so adorable. He is so adorable. And every time he just looks at me, I'm captivated. Right? Captivated. And I just want this moment. I want it to last forever. It's very possible this is it. This is the last one. It's even likely. So I was thinking what I could do about this. Uh Because we can't have so much change. I just happened to have this magic lotion. It's called pause lotion. Uh, It doesn't work on adults because I've been using it and there's no pausing. But I think it could work on the babies. Doesn't that feel good? Yeah. And it's just for a day. That's all it's good for. Uh, which is probably why it doesn't work on adults. Adults are too big. But it's just for a day. And, you know, what, what is the harm in delaying his growth for a day? What's the harm? Hmm? <laughs> Lance and Dean, they're starting to know what I'm talking about. What's the harm in delaying that? One day is going to lead to another day, and pretty soon, like, he's already wearing pants. Come on. What is this? We've got to keep this babydom going. So we'll put some more on tomorrow and the next day, and, you know, pretty soon it's really obvious that this is a great thing. I get to have a baby all the time, right? And, you know, it doesn't stay at my house, so it's even extra better, <laughs> right? And this could go on and on, couldn't it? What would be the harm in that? I might even convince myself that it's good for me, right? I just like it so much. Look at me. Are we talking about you? Maybe we're not. We're talking about change, right? And you're going to change. That's inevitable. But what about kingship? Is kingship going to change? We're in danger. We're in danger because we're a church plant. And church plants are always in danger of the people in the plant not wanting change, not liking change, deciding change isn't good. And so let's just stay small like this. It's intimate. It feels wonderful. What could be the harm? And so we're in danger of being strangled and smothered by people who aren't willing to accept the change and to see the potential that any church, that kingship has. I want Rick to come up here. Thank you, Rick. Rick, Rick doesn't know what I'm doing. He has no idea. He barely knows this. So, this guy is the first He's the first one. Maybe Hezekiah, he might be the last one. What would be the harm? We'd be keeping Hezekiah from becoming a mature man. We can't have that. That's wrong. That's not good. And we can't have kingship dying because we can't figure out how to move into the work of the harvest.